to the Vin Armani Show. I'm Vin Armani. It's 10 a.m. on Monday, so uh, here we are, coming to you live from fabulous Las Vegas. And you can check us out every Monday, streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Vin Armani. Also on Twitter and Periscope, that's at Vin Armani. And you can check us out on Facebook, streaming on the Facebook page of our content partner, Activist Post. And if you're not following them, please go and follow them. They, uh, they've been wonderful. We're, I think we're in about 14 weeks into doing the show, and we really could not have done it without them. So today, wonderful show for you. Obviously, the big news of the week, Donald Trump is now the President of the United States. It's been an interesting few days, and we're going to discuss what it means now. I mean, there's always campaign promises, and then there's what somebody actually does. I've been actually personally surprised, so I'm interested to talk about this. And there are some people who are not so happy about Donald Trump being president, and they've shown, uh, they've shown themselves, and they've demonstrated, and we're going to talk about that story as well. We also have a very, very cool story about uh, an asteroid. But my... The best part of the show, I think, today is my guest, and that is Kat Courtney, master herbalist, friend of mine, uh, the organizer of I the ayahuasca ceremonies that I have done myself, um, and we're going to be talking about plant medicine, ayahuasca, uh, ibogaine, and probably quite a few others. One of the most interesting people I know. I know that you're going to enjoy this guest. And to help me do all of that, if I'm the president of the show, my VP, my great friend, co-host, and producer, Mr. Christian Reyes. Christian, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, sir. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it got really, really, really real. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a different... We're living in some crazy times, man. Yeah. We really, really are. Really crazy times. Things are, things are changing. I've actually been surprised over the last couple of days. I'm, an, I'm naturally a cynic, mm -hmm. okay? I'm naturally a cynic about politicians. Yep. And the last time that I voted for president was Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. As a black man, I was like, okay. I, I had a lot of reservations about the guy. I was like, okay, he's definitely just been put forward by the... Uh, by the establishment. This was yeah. eight years ago, you know, when he first ran. But I was like, you know what? But if he, first black president, if I don't vote for him and he turns out to be halfway decent, but before he was even in office, before he was inaugurated, I remember going on Facebook at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Howard University. I went to a, a mainly black university mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C., Right, so you could probably imagine that a lot of my friends from college were yeah. at the inauguration. They were very excited, uh -huh. educated, you know, politically savvy. Not just, you know, they. I mean, they really were looking at policy and whatnot, and we would discuss those things. But when he kept George Bush's Secretary of Defense Robert Gates on as his Secretary of Defense, I knew I was like, okay. Yeah, I voted for the guy. He hasn't been inaugurated yet, but I was like, okay, I know what's coming. I get it. But that has not been the case for Mr. Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. He's done some things differently. I mean, so let's, let's look at this. I think more important than having a first black president or having a first woman president, for me as an anarchist, as a voluntarist, as someone who is interested in a peaceful, stateless yeah. society, who wants less violence in the world. The idea of having not just the first president who's never held public office, mm -hmm. which means who's never held the gun of the state to the heads right. of someone else, exactly, yeah. but also to have the first businessman mm -hmm. president, the first entrepreneur, Somebody has actually done it. Well, and somebody who has not been a part of the parasite class. Yeah. Which is what I call the political class. I call them the parasite class. <laughs> well, because think about it. The, the, the government doesn't make anything. Mm -hmm. When they talk about revenue, when they talk about bringing in more revenue, what they're talking about is taxing the people more. Mm -hmm. 
And the main people who get taxed, like Mitt Romney famously, you know, with his like 74% of people don't pay taxes, not really true. But when you look at the income tax, every single person who gets a full refund, who goes to H&R Block, fills out their thing and gets a full refund of their taxes, you're not a taxpayer. Mm -hmm. You're not an income taxpayer. You didn't pay anything. Where do you think the money's coming from? It's, we know it. Yeah. <laughs> right? As entrepreneurs, uh -huh. as business people, as people who for years have paid our rent by businesses that we have built mm -hmm. and continue to build and run. Until you've done business in this country, until you know how difficult it is and how much you're going to be squeezed by the government, you really don't understand how any of this shit works. Mm -hmm. You really don't. And it's one thing to have, like, you know, internet business. Now it's good because people could start something and sell on Craigslist or eBay. But I tell people, if you really want to... Penn Gillette, he said, famous, famously, he's got a show here, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm friends with, friends with his family, famous libertarian. Mm -hmm. Famous atheist. Yeah. He said, when they said, well, what turns you into an atheist? He said, reading the Bible. He said, if you, if you want to be, if, if the greatest way to create atheists is sit someone down and have them read the Bible cover to cover, you'll walk away from it an atheist, which is true. The more of it you read, the, the more you're like, this is bullshit, which is part of the reason why for the church for thousands of years, it was very important that people didn't read it. You know, it was, it was Martin Luther. That was right. part of the Protestant Reformation was until Martin Luther translated the Bible into German, German people had never read the Bible. When they went to mass, the mass was in Latin, mm -hmm. a language they didn't even speak. They're sitting in a church worshiping and the priest is saying words that they can't even understand. The Bible, they can't even read it. They don't even read mm -hmm. the language. So imagine, right? So if you want to become an atheist, read the Bible. If you want to become an anarchist, Go try to start a hot dog stand business in your local town. <laughs> See what it takes to sell a hot dog on the street mm -hmm. in your local town. And you will realize, wow, government is a huge impediment. They're not protecting anybody. Mm -hmm. They're squeezing the population. So that's my own opinion. I've thought... It's going to be interesting to see if a businessman president is going to actually act in the interest mm -hmm. of entrepreneurs, which we are. But he sh shook some things up already, yeah. so, and that's news number one. First news story, man. This dude, it's going to be an interesting four years if he makes it that far. <laughs> uh, he's doing some things that I have not seen done and that I really didn't expect. I've gone ahead and his inauguration speech from the jump was, it's, it was funny because after this speech, the media, the mainstream media, I could hear sort of the collective gasp because he did not pull any punches. It was actually in many ways a much more forceful, they called it divisive. I didn't see it as necessarily divisive, but he was definitely calling some people out in some ways that he hadn't even on the campaign trail. I cut a couple of clips of that. Uh, Christian, why don't we go ahead and, and, and watch these clips and then we can, uh, we can discuss. For too long, a small group in our nation's capital has reaped the rewards of government while the people have borne the cost. Washington flourished, but the people did not share in its wealth. Politicians prospered, but the jobs left and the factories closed. The establishment protected itself, but not the citizens of our country. Their victories have not been your victories. Their triumphs have not been your triumphs. And while they celebrated in our nation's capital, there was little to celebrate for struggling families all across our land. A decree to be heard in every city, 
in every foreign capital and in every hall of power. From this day forward, a new vision will govern our land. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America first. Start winning again. Winning like never before. We will bring back our jobs. We will bring back our borders. We will bring back our wealth. And we will bring back our dreams. We will build new roads and highways and bridges and airports and tunnels and railways all across our wonderful nation. We will get our people off of welfare and back to work, rebuilding our country with American hands and American labor. We will seek friendship and goodwill with the nations of the world, but we do so with the understanding that it is the right of all nations to put their own interests first. We do not seek to impose our way of life on anyone, but rather to let it shine as an example. We will shine for everyone to follow. Think big and dream even bigger. In America, we understand that a nation is only living as long as it is striving. We will no longer accept politicians who are all talk and no action, constantly complaining, but never doing anything about it. The time for empty talk is over. Now arrives the hour of action. Pretty powerful speech there. And extremely powerful and extremely ballsy, considering the fact that those politicians that he's talking about and is insinuating are all talk and no action, were sitting five feet away from him, uh, one of whom, Barack Obama, had what, just handed over the mantle of, I guess, what they would call the most powerful office in the world. So, Christian, pretty interesting, pretty interesting attack going Very straight at him. What, what I found most interesting about it, though, was that he, the, that level of populism, mm -hmm. that level of saying, I am not a politician. Many times in the speech, he said, uh, this is the day that we, America gets taken back and given back to the people. The people. It, was a it was a very libertarian speech. Mm -hmm. It was a very kind of like channeling Andrew Jackson, who was incredibly divisive at his time. Mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson, also incredibly divisive at his time. You know, the worry about him, the worry about Trump, Right from the people who are, are his distract, uh, detractors has been that he's going to be some sort of a fascist dictator. Mm -hmm. He's going to be some sort of a Hitler type. And if you're looking to see if someone's going to be a dictator or not, one of the things that is the hallmark of a dictator is expansion of government. Yeah. Expansion of the role of government, expansion of the power of government. Trump's already taken, I mean, he just got sworn in on Friday. Mm -hmm. First day, out the box, he did some things. So I want to take a look at those things. First thing is the TPP, which he said, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is from the Nikkei Asian Review. U.S. announces withdrawal from TPP. Soon after President Donald Trump was sworn in, his administration announced the U.S. withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a trade pact championed by former President Barack Obama and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. The White House on Friday also wasted no time in declaring a renegotiation of the North Atlantic Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA. Trump is expected to take a more isolationist, protectionist stand, and the international community is concerned that the U.S. will continue to draw inward. T 
TPP, Christian was, that was a big issue for uh, Mr. Bernie Sanders as well. Huge issue. That in fact, that was one of the places where uh, Bernie Sanders' candidacy actually made Hillary Clinton change her yeah. platform. Mm -hmm. She was initially a supporter of TPP. Her husband put NAFTA into place. Mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders went in hard on both NAFTA and TPP, right? The hard left, who's been anti-Trump, one of Bernie Sanders' biggest planks, we got to end the TP, we got to not do TPP, we got to end NAFTA. Trump comes in, withdraws from TPP, mm -hmm. says we're going to renegotiate NAFTA, and if the negotiation doesn't work out, we're going we're gonna to withdraw. Interesting. Interesting. It's actually, we were talking a little bit about it yesterday, and usually you mentioned that um, a dictator would want to get more gain more power gain more power gain more government and i think in this particular situation trump has actually given a little bit of power to the people and to the you know and which is really is different well and the other thing is you know when they say oh he's just gonna he's only out to benefit his corporate billionaire buddies you yeah. know the interesting thing about all of these uh free trade agreements is that they do more benefit multinational like the tpp had actually set up a situation where uh governments could not take punitive action against corporations it was heavily slanted mm. towards the corporations as is nafta but you have to realize that's not really the type of businessman that donald trump is like people expect him I don't know why there's this expectation that he's going to be so friendly. Yes, his cabinet does have some people who have been in some, some larger corporations, yeah. but this dude is, is such a narcissist mm -hmm. that it's going to be his way or the highway. Yeah. He really is a, he, he is not a multinational, you know, conglomerate. Yes, he has businesses in other places, but that's mm -hmm. not the type of guy that he is. He started with a few properties and he grew it and he's always been at the top of his own company. Yeah. You know, there's a very few business people, uh, it, even in American history, who want to have that sort of level of micromanagement. It's, it says a lot. It's interesting. Very Other interesting. thing that he did, this was not actually him. This, is, this was on regulations. Now, Trump put a freeze on new regulations. The White House Chief of Staff, Reince Priebus, issued a memorandum Friday night, so that was the first night of the presidency, to all executive departments and agencies to freeze newer pending regulations, giving the new administration time to review them. Now, this is actually pretty standard. Uh, Obama administration had done a, a similar thing as well. It gives President Trump the ability to declare an an immediate impact on the regulations that Republicans have long slammed as burdensome on business, a major promise of his administration, and actually just breaking. And we'll, we'll show this. I may, have you, I may have you cut out of this, but because it's rather long. Just breaking, uh, he actually just gave a few minutes ago a little press conference about regulations. Let's just skip ahead forward to uh, this is the... Um, Oh, I don't even, uh, it's the, yeah, it's the regular, do we have the regulation video? Did I put that in there? Do you see that? Okay, let's go ahead and show. We don't. Huh. Interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, th I thought that I, huh, weird. I thought that I had. Okay. Are you sure? Yeah. After the, after the uh, cut, after cuts. No. Okay. Interesting. All right. Well, I guess we don't have that. But he had, he had come on, I'll tell, I'll tell you what it was. He had come on and he was discussing cutting regulations by up to 75%, which is pretty amazing as a business person. I definitely like to hear that. The other thing that he did, and this, was, this is one that is controversial. Uh, you have this uh, Obamacare clip. No? No, but oh, I guess that's the cut. Next is an executive order minimizing the economic burden of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act pending repeal. Okay, so yeah, we've got, as you can see, we've switched some things around on the show, and I just tried to get that in this morning, but. 
This is the story. Uh, Trump signs executive order that could effectively gut Affordable Care Act's individual mandate. What he did here was very, very interesting. He used an executive order in a way that President Obama had previously used it. Some people, especially the weed smokers, may be aware that President Obama, without changing the federal laws and federal regulations on marijuana, in order to enable the states to sort of make their own decisions about legalizing and doing medical marijuana, gave an executive order to the DEA essentially to not go after marijuana, to not prosecute outside of what the states were, were doing with their own laws. So he didn't change the law, but he just said, we're not going to enforce the law. That's essentially what Trump did here. We actually have the text of this, uh, the ACA text here, Christian. So this is a part of the executive order. The most important part is this section two. And this is what it says. To the maximum extent permitted by law, the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the heads of all other executive departments and agencies with authorities and responsibilities under the Act shall exercise all authority and discretion available to them to waive, defer, grant exemptions from, or delay the implementation of any provision or requirement of the Act that would impose a fiscal burden, this is important, on any state or a cost, fee, tax, penalty, or regulatory burden on individuals, families, health care providers, health insurers, patients, recipients of health care services, purchasers of health, health insurance, or makers of medical devices, products, or medic medications. So Christian, what this says is, okay, yes, there is an individual mandate, meaning you must buy insurance by law. Mm -hmm. But he's t ordering his departments be that IRS, be that Health and Human Services, whatever it is, to not, to basically not enforce it, not enforce the law. to whatever power that they have within the law, to either not go after people, to grant waivers, to grant exemptions, to just delay mm -hmm. ever doing anything about it. This is a this is a really important, and I think it's something that libertarians, especially the the big L libertarians, the libertarian party people, the libertarians who are are what I call statist libertarians, yeah. minarchists, the ones who are like, no, we still need a government. W one thing that they don't realize is that for if you're if you're an anarchist, and when you really deal with government. There are basically three, three levels at which the power of the state happens, or sort of three prerequisites mm -hmm. in order for the state to touch you, in order for the state to, to coerce you violently, right? Most libertarians only think of the first one. The first one is scope, which is like the extent of the law. Okay. What does the law allow? What laws are written? Most of those libertarians are like, we're going to go and we're going to change the laws. We're going to go in and we're going to change the laws. Scope is actually the least important. It's the least important of all of them. Hmm. The second one, then the last two are important. The second one is, is reach, right? Yeah. Can the government actually reach you? Because it doesn't matter what the scope is. There are places in this country where the government just simply cannot reach you. Mm -hmm. If you live in a cabin in the Alaskan wilderness that can only be reached by seaplane, that there are no roads to get to yeah. it, you're pretty much exempt from the law. Yeah. Not because laws don't exist, but because there's, the government doesn't have the capability to reach you. Got it. This could also happen in a case where, let's say you live in, um, no, I'll give you an example. I ran a pirate radio station in LA yeah. for two years, uh -huh. okay, on FM. But because of where our transmitter was located, because of the times that we broadcasted, because of the budgets of the FCC, they simply didn't have a staff to come out and stop us. Mm -hmm. Because the, it, pirate radio wasn't a big problem in LA, and because it wasn't something they were constantly focused on, and because it wasn't something that they were budgeting for a full-time staff, we knew that we were pretty much okay because there was a lack of reach. Yeah. Right? 
The third one, though, I think is the most important, and that's what he's dealing with. And the third one is will. Ah. The will of the agent to actually enforce the law. And an example of this would be any time that someone has been pulled over by a cop, when they have, for, say, actually been speeding, actually yeah. ran a red light, actually ran a stop sign, and the cop lets you go with a warning, mm -hmm. that's will. If law enforcement is simply unwilling to enforce a law, an example of this would be Washington, D.C., there are jaywalking laws on the books, mm -hmm. but it's just an, a known aspect of the culture there that you don't ever have to, that you will never get a ticket for jaywalking. You can cross the street anywhere you want in front of a police officer. I don't know if it's still like this, but it was certainly when I was there, and it was a shock to me coming from California, yeah. where you'll get a jaywalking <laughs> ticket. People were like, nah, just, just, just cross. There's a cop right there. <laughs> just cross. And the cop would look at you, and there's... Because there's no will to enforce it. And so, and this happens a lot in third world countries as well, mm -hmm. right? Where it's, you go down to Mexico, it, it's, will is really there because it's like, well, we'd rather have you hand us some money yeah. than take you off to jail. Mm -hmm. So you have those three things. And as, as you can see, what's written in terms of law is actually not as important because even if things aren't on the books, like every time somebody's civil rights are violated, Every time somebody is shot in the back by a police officer, mm -hmm. that is reach and will. He's gone way outside of scope. Mm -hmm. Reach and will are the most important two. Very interesting. So that's what Trump is playing around with, is he's playing around with will. Yeah. He's the main enforcer of these things. He gets to say, you're going to do it or you're not going to do it we're going to prioritize this or not prioritize this. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's not a way that you can, it's interesting, it's not a way that you can make more government without going through the legislature, but it's a way that you can make less government without going uh, through the legislature. Yeah. Hmm. So we may be starting to see that this is really what this guy wants to do. It's cool stuff. It's, I mean, it's very, very interesting. Yeah. What is this? Uh, oh, those, are the, those were the cuts. That was the cuts. That's what, that was what that That's video, video was. So here we've got a guy. Okay, so far what we see is he's taking government away, mm -hmm. reducing government, reducing regulations, making things easier for business, which there's no question about it. Any economist is going to say, that when you make life easier for business, it's going to flourish. You're going to have more jobs. Yep. The more restrictions you put on on business, the less jobs, the less prosperity. The less because where does your wealth comes from? Business in yeah. our society, wealth is created by business. It's mm -hmm. the one and only place that is created. It's self-evident. Mm -hmm. If you want a country to be wealthy, you want a country to be prosperous. The business has to be prosperous. And it can't be prosperous when it's, when it's so regular. or um, regulated. regulated. When it's regulated, I mean, if, prime example, man, they wanted to, you know, Fremont East yeah. here in downtown Vegas is booming. It mm -hmm. took like five years for them to get that up, right? One of the things that they did was the city council said, okay, we want that to be an uh, adult entertainment adult entertainment. We want that to be a bars and nightlife, restaurants, right. all of these things for adults. And we want businesses to come and move in. So they said, we're going to put a moratorium. We're not going to charge a tavern license fee, $20,000 tavern license fee. Basically, they took out a regulation. Mm -hmm. and that first. all by itself, boom. boom. Yeah. Because when you take away barriers to entry, people enter. <laughs> But there is a move, and it's understandable. There are people who are worried about, well, if you take away regulations, what's going to happen to the environment? When you take away regulations, what's going to happen to people, poor people? Mm -hmm. Are people going to be able to have jobs? What if you take away regulations on minimum wage? What if you take away regulations on work safety? What if you take away regulations on... What people don't understand is 99% of the regulations have nothing to do with that. 
99% of the regulations are just another way for the government to have control over some mm -hmm. random, stupid little thing, some little stupid Ridiculous. fee here, yep. some a, a fact, a, a time when you've got to grab, you know, have a, some millions of, of dollars spent to get some inspector out to stay full time, like on a, if you have a poultry farm or something mm -hmm. like that. It's all of these little regulations. And it's very big with the left. And the, one of the reasons why it's big with the left is because they're working in those fields. They're the ones doing the inspections. Mm -hmm. They're the ones writing up the papers on, for the regulations and whatnot. And the left sure did show out the day after Trump's, uh, Trump's inauguration. We had the Women's March. We're going to do a little thing here, talk a little bit about it. Hundreds of thousands of people poured into D.C. for the Women's March on Washington. Just going to read the text on this video while it's going. They came by foot, bike, car, train, and plane. 112 to Baltimore. Everybody say... Women's March! A kickoff rally of speakers and performers lasted more than five hours. This is the upside of the downside. This is an outpouring of energy and true democracy like I have never Gloria seen Gloria Steinem, in my uh, admitted long, CIA, long, former CIA operative or agent, present, president, asset, we're never going home, we're staying together, and we're taking over. Our approach to freedom is Janet Mock, she's a trans advocate. But it must be intersectional and inclusive. We're not going to take this lying down. Planned Cecile Richards. The problem. We're the solution. We are collectively Kamala Harris. In a mirror and with furrowed brow asking this question, who are we? I didn't shed blood to defend this nation. I didn't give up Senator Tammy Duckworth. my body to have the Constitution trampled on. There's so many people. Miriam Ali. Television for hours and hours. They know every rule of the NBA and the NFL, but they don't know how local government works. It took this Madonna. horrific moment of darkness to wake us the f up. Good did not win this election, but good will win in the end. You may have read a story that said that we are not marching. I am here to tell you we are marching. Listen to your bodies. Do not march if you do not feel up to it. My body, my choice. These are anti-abortion advocates facing off with abortion rights advocates. <laughs> Not be in your own it says, as the day wore on, activists continued to make their way around the city. These were massive marches. They were massive. They were worldwide. I have family members who participated in them. My mother, as a matter of fact, was at the LA March, which uh, they said had 750,000 people. You know, I have really looked around to try and understand what exactly the march was for. And when people have been asked, they've said, we want to make sure Donald Trump does not forget about women, which is interesting to me, considering that he, here's a man who has daughters and granddaughters that he loves, obviously, very much, cares for, trusts his business with, trusts as his advisors, closest advisors, Ivanka Trump certainly, Interestingly, Trump's daughters and granddaughters were at the inauguration. I didn't see the Obama daughters. Found that very interesting. It seems that there were two issues, mainly. We could say three, but one is rather minor. And it sort of draws back to Hillary Clinton and her basket of deplorables comment. The idea behind this and as you saw from the signs, uh, very anti-Trump. It was clearly an anti-Trump rally. The speakers were clearly anti-Trump. It was clearly about that, that a horrible person had been elected. 
And it basically goes back to the idea that has been perpetrated or pushed with the basket of deplorables idea. And Hillary Clinton said, you can basically group about half of Trump supporters into a basket of deplorables, thereby pushing it also onto the idea that Donald Trump himself holds these values. She said, racist, sexist, homophobic, Islamophobic. Basically coming out of three ideas. And I just, as this whole thing starts, I'm not a defender of Donald Trump. I'm an anarchist. I've called him a narcissistic sociopath. I do believe he's a narcissistic, narcissistic sociopath. I believe Hillary Clinton is a murderous psychopath. I think a narcissistic sociopath may be exactly what it takes to reduce government to actually stand in the face of challenges. And anybody who shrinks government, which is so far what he's done, is heading in the direction that I like, <laughs> as an anarchist, as a voluntarist, as a matter of principle. And so far, that's what I've seen him do. We're gonna be on him, and we're gonna be as critical of his behavior because he is gonna have to do some things globally that we are not going to like, and we are going to criticize the shit out of him. But if I'm gonna have a, an intellectually honest criticism. It needs to start from what's actually occurring. And with Donald Trump, the basic three issues have been that he, three things that he has said on the campaign trail that has been keyed in on was, first, he's going to deport all the Muslims. Okay, we don't know whether that's going to happen or he's going to stop immigrants from Muslim countries. We're going to wait and see about that and we're going to talk about it. That ha this is something that he actually has to be president to do. We're going to see. I don't think he exactly said those things. So far, I haven't seen any policy that said that. Okay. The second thing was, and this is the, this is the first issue that we're going to cover. The second thing was, if you talk to people, he says, Donald Trump said all Mexicans are, racist, uh, are rapists, so he's a racist. He said all Mexicans are rapists, he's going to build a wall, and he's going to deport all the people who are here illegally. That's what, that's what supposedly Donald Trump is going to do, so that makes him a racist. Now, so far, that's, when people say Donald Trump is a racist, that's the only thing that they can point to so far. I'm still waiting for like other racist comments that he's made somewhere on tape. I mean, the man's been in the public eye for 30 years. And if you could, all you can find is this one thing that we're going to look at. I don't know. I, like, I don't know. If he said all Mexicans are rapists, that yes, that is incredibly racist. We just got to examine whether he said that. And the third thing is grab him in the pussy. And we're going to talk about that. The, the, thing that he said, he was caught on a hot mic 11 years ago in a conversation with Billy Bush saying grab him in the pussy. But first, let's look at this all Mexicans are rapists thing. This is taken from a quote from Donald Trump. Let's read the actual quote. This is Donald Trump, June 16, 2015, when he, I guess he formally announced his candidacy. He said, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. He points at the crowd. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. And some, I assume, are good people. So for the first thing right out of the gate, he did not say all Mexicans are, are rapists because he said, and some, I assume, are good people. And he's not talking about all Mexicans. He's talking specifically about people who are coming in illegally. So he said three things. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. Okay, so Christian, this thing has been carried on. I want to just one final time discuss whether or not Donald Trump is making a racist statement by saying this. You're of Latino background. Mm -hmm. I'm Mexican. I look at this. People crossing the border illegally, he says they're bringing drugs. We know that's 150,000% true. <laughs> that's how drugs from Mexico get into the United States. They cross, the, they certainly don't go to a border checkpoint with a <laughs> van filled with coke. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they're moving these things in smuggling yeah. routes and they're smuggling drugs and they're smuggling people. They're bringing drugs, he says. They're bringing crime. Well, 
the organizations that are doing that. Well, first off, bringing trafficking drugs across the border is crime. Yep. But the organizations that are bringing them across are the drug cartels. And they're criminals. <laughs> Not are only are they criminals, but they are murdering exactly. thousands upon thousands of people. And the same people who are, who are participating in this, these same groups, are the ones smuggling both drugs and people. Mm -hmm. no now, good. the last part is very interesting. And many people don't know this. And it's so poignant for the Women's March. It's so important to me, mm -hmm. as someone who loves women, as someone who people, uh, people know, I mean, I've, I spend my days and I've spent my life trying to better understand how to make women happy. Yep. That's what I do. I love women. <laughs> and so it really, really angers me. I mean, of all the crimes out there, rape is so pernicious. Mm -hmm so terrible this one when i looked into it deeper and said why is he saying they're rapists what is this rape thing about where does this come from well where it comes from is a 2010 report by amnesty international that's what he was referring to so you have this amnesty it's called Invisible Victims, Migrants on the Move in Mexico. It's by Amnesty International, and I want to say it again, Amnesty International wrote this, okay? Amnesty International. There's a reason why I'm saying this name over and over and over, because I want you to remember it. Here's what Amnesty International says about rape as it deals with illegal immigration. Here's the text. Women and girl migrants, especially those without legal status, traveling rem in remote areas or on trains, are at heightened risk of sexual violence at the hands of criminal gangs, the criminals, they're bringing crime, people traffickers, other migrants, or corrupt officials. Sexual violence, or the threat of sexual violence, is often used as a means of terrorizing women and their relatives. Many criminal gangs appear to use sexual violence as part of the price demanded of migrants. According to some experts, the prevalence of rape is such that people smugglers may require women to have a contraceptive injection prior to the journey as a precaution against pregnancy resulting from rape. It is a widely held view shared by local and international non-governmental organizations and health professionals working with migrant women that as many as six in 10 migrant women and girls are raped. A study in, 20, in 2006 interviewed 90 migrant women held in Iztapalapa Migrants Detention Center of whom just over half were from Central America. 23 out of those 90 women reported experiencing some kind of violence, including sexual violence. Of these, 13 stated the person responsible was a state official. Researchers carrying out the study believe the figures may significantly understate the problem because of the reluctance of, violence of, of women to discuss sexual violence, particularly when they are in detention. Now, I just want you to stop for one minute, 60%, 60% of migrant women crossing illegally are raped on their journey, according to Amnesty International. There was a, a study more recent by Fusion that went and did in-person interviews at these health centers, and they said the number is closer to 80%. 80% of women crossing illegally, are suffering sexual violence, are being raped. They're being raped by the smugglers who are bringing them across. They're being raped by corrupt government, Mexican government officials, and they're being raped by other migrants. That means that part, some percentage of the people who are men who are crossing the border illegally are rapists. That's what Donald Trump said. Women, women who are marching. There is a man who was running for president against a woman. Did that woman 
bring up the fact that thousands upon thousands of innocent women are being raped because of the system that is in place to smuggle them into the United States? Or did he bring it up? The guy who's anti-woman. But he has daughters and granddaughters, so you think he might give a shit about rapists entering the country, said by Amnesty International saying that rapists are entering in, into the country. But what pisses me off even more, Amnesty International is the one that says, yes, there are rapists entering the country. We know this. But when Donald Trump is elected, do we have this co-sponsor? Amnesty International USA to co-sponsor Women's March on Washington on January 21st. Amnesty International is a co-sponsor of the anti-Trump Women's March, saying that Trump is against women's rights. It says, we decided to co-sponsor the Women's March on Washington to help send a loud and clear message that human rights must be respected. I think not being raped is a human right. Do, what do you think, Christian? I'm a little, I'm, I'm this it, pisses me off. This is crazy shit. This is just It crazy. really, really, really pisses me off. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's, I don't even know. It's evil. It's brainwashing. It's. It's just crazy. And now you have, how many people did the march? Oh, millions. millions, right? Millions. Millions of people are participating in this. So we're more angry at Donald Trump saying that there are rapists crossing the border, which Amnesty International says, than we are at the rapists. Exactly. Exactly. What the fuck? fuck. <laughs> yep. And which brings us to the second thing. Because the whole, the whole narrative about Donald Trump being disrespectful to women was the comment that he said with Billy Bush, right? Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about the truth. What was the comment? It was 11 years ago. He didn't know his mic was hot. They're sitting, getting ready to go and walk out. Mm -hmm. It was for Access Hollywood or some dumbass show. He's sitting, talking with Billy Bush, somebody that he knows, a Bush cousin. And he's like, man, you know, he's talking about celebrity. Yeah. And he's like, you know, shit, when you're famous, it's crazy. Women are crazy for celebrity. Mm -hmm. They'll let you do anything. Billy Bush is like, oh, really, anything? He's like, yeah, yeah, you could just walk up and kiss him. He's like, oh, what? He's like, yeah, you can just <laughs> grab him in the pussy. <laughs> Obviously a joke. Yeah. Obviously a joke. Now, here's what I want to say about the grab him in the pussy thing. I think this is important to say. If you are a heterosexual man, and you have not made a crass sexual joke when only in the presence of other men mm -hmm. who are your friends. If you have never done that in your life, I don't fucking trust you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't fucking trust you. There's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. For that matter, if you are a woman... And for, I say heterosexual because if you're a gay man and you have never talked about grabbing another man's <laughs> junk, come on, dudes. It's, it's, <laughs> you, you, it's just, you, no. It's just, it doesn't even exist, right? But by the same token, if you're a woman and you haven't made a crass it's, sexual yeah. comment, I don't trust you. If you're an adult, come on, man. But that's the main Trump and so what? They were knitting pink pussy hats and this whole thing. They, mm -hmm. People were dressed up as pussies. The whole thing, like, this pussy grabs back. It's just, it, it, makes, it makes absolutely no sense. No sense. No sense. And the person who made the least sense <laughs> in this whole situation was our good friend who we saw a little earlier, but we have a much better clip, Madonna. Yes! I am outraged. Yes. See if you can get cat on too. I have too. thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. But I know that this won't change anything. 
We cannot fall into despair. As the poet W.H. Auden once wrote on the eve of World War II, we must love one another or die. I choose love. Are you with me? Say this with me. We choose love. We choose love. We choose love. Now, perhaps Madonna doesn't actually understand what it is to actually choose love, to truly, genuinely choose love, not just as like pablum, but to really choose love. People who choose love don't think about blowing up buildings. M mute her, please. I, I see we've got... Ca thank, thank you, Christian. People who really choose love don't think about blowing up buildings. I get where I get what she was where she was going with it. Like I understand, I understand that it's just talk. But if I constantly think about blowing up the White House is just talk and it's funny, I think grab him in the pussy can be funny as well. I mean, one is talking about destruction of property and possibly murdering somebody, and the other is talking about violating someone's, you know, violating someone's body. Welcome back to the Vin Armani Show. We are broadcasting live from Las Vegas, and we are streaming on YouTube at youtube.com slash Vin Armani, also on Twitter and Periscope at Vin Armani. And you can also stream us on the Facebook page of our content partner, Activist Post. Now, we had a few technical difficulties with some brand new changes that we are making to the show, but we are back, and we are back with a guest that I am very glad to have on. I have been eagerly awaiting her being on the show. I'd like to welcome Kat Courtney to the show. <laughs> okay. Kat, this is the Chris. So far in 14 shows, this is the craziest, uh, this is the craziest technical difficulties that we have had. But that, I mean, that might be, you got to struggle to get there. And this is a very important conversation. And so I'd like to have this one over the, over the whole hour. But by way of introduction, if I can, Kat Courtney is a master herbalist with special concentrations in plant spirit medicine. She has 11 years of experience with ayahuasca and wachuma, eight as an apprentice. Kat has been in over 1,200 plant ceremonies, including a couple hundred in Peru. She's now focused on using plants and shamanic rituals to help people make peace with mortality as an afterlife coach. In this practice, she works with both terminal patients in hospice and non-terminal folks who just want to connect with the other side and let go of the fear of dying. She's also in the process of launching an online marketing agency for cause-oriented businesses called Red Roar. Kat Courtney, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ben. So happy to be here. I am happy to have you too, even with our little, uh, our little situation. You can see that I'm dressed for the occasion. I'm ready to go down the rabbit <laughs> hole and go into the jungle. Um, you, have, you really have been a special person to me in my life and of all of the guests that I have had on the show so far. I definitely have the most personal relationship with you. Uh, were it not for you, I don't think that I would have ever been introduced to ayahuasca, which I probably wouldn't be doing this show right now had I not been introduced to ayahuasca. So uh, the first thing I want to say is I, I really want to say thank you. Uh, could you. Could you let people know... Well, maybe before we talk about the vine and before we talk about the plant medicine, can we talk a little bit about you? Uh, I had a, actually a friend of mine ask me the other day, and it was very recently, and they said, um, well, how is it? You're just different. You're a different type of person. Like, how is it that you're able to walk through the world in this kind of calm way? You don't seem like you're scared. Like, it, I just really don't feel that fear. And it was immediate that I just said, I'm pretty sure that it's my journeys with psychedelics. I'm pretty sure that that's, I, there's a lot of spiritual practice that I'm done, but, I've done, but I think that's the one. 
You've had ex an extreme amount of experience, and you've shared it with a lot of people. How did your own... So I found ayahuasca when I was 30. So, okay. you know, in an astrological sense, we do the solar return when we're 30, and, like, the first life crisis can come up. And, and I was totally in crisis. I mean, I was a um, heavy alcohol and drug user for escapism, not for mm. the expansion of consciousness. Big difference. Um, and I had, you know, migraine headaches, all kinds of physical issues. Emotionally, I was so fear-based that calling and ordering a pizza was kind of terrifying. Hmm. I didn't tell people this. It was all under wraps. But, you know, I was a mess. And I was dating somebody who's like a super famous Hollywood special effects guy. And he said the word ayahuasca to me one day. He was like, do you want to go to the jungle and do this? And I figured it was another drug that I've right. done tons of. And I'm like, yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> And of course, it was a little different, but um, I certainly, like you, I attribute my blessing of working with that plant in particular for not being a fear-based hot mess anymore. I mean, I'm still neurotic, but, you know, that's a good thing. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so, you know, fast forward 11 years and 1,200 journeys, and uh, I've changed a lot. So let's talk about that, that first journey. How much did you know about what it was that you were getting into and how did that, how did that first journey go down for you? So intellectually, I knew very little. I had read the, the famous National Geographic article that was really um, prominent. This is in 2006, so there wasn't a lot of information about it then like there is now. So I really didn't know anything. I heard the word and knew I had to do it. So my, but when I got there in the jungle, we didn't drink the medicine for the first couple of days. And I had a total meltdown, Ben. If I could have ran away, I would have, but mm. I was stuck in the jungle. And the reason for that is that I just felt in my beingness that this was different, that all of my self-hatred and fear, everything came up to the surface and I didn't want to deal with it. You know, I wanted out, but the shaman, saw where I was and what I was going through without me having to say anything and he got me to stay. He was like, he said the words, you are perfect for this work, which I thought was insane, but I trusted him. And the first ceremony is fairly, mine was fairly typical that a lot of people have. It was really heart opening and gentle and I felt my consciousness expand and I felt a trust with the plant. Hmm. The second ceremony was hell. The second ceremony was the dark night of the soul. You know, went straight into my shadow, into all the things that I, I feared. And it's hard to describe, right? I know you've been there and mm -hmm. it's hard to put words to, but, but I knew inherently that it wasn't the drug creating a negative experience, right? The right. medicine was showing me the shadow that I was afraid of, you know, my entire life and giving me an opportunity to create a different relationship with it. So, so I drank the next night, even though I'd had the worst night ever, and most people think that's crazy. Like, why would you go drink the same substance right. that put you through hell? It's because I knew that, that she was gonna take me to the other side if I was uh, brave enough to go there. And within three ceremonies, I felt like I you know, transformed significantly. I went back to my home in LA and changed my entire life. Now, was I fixed? No, and I never will be. You know, um, all of the things that that my ego grappled with and feared, I still deal with as a consciousness. But I just have more tools and more expansion expansiveness now that it doesn't affect me in the same way. But it was a wild ride, and it continues to be. So let's for the for those people who don't know, and this was also uh, what this this was a very uh, mind expanding for me. Uh, as well with my experience with ayahuasca. I've obvious, I'm obviously a, I guess you could say that I am a proponent of experimentation with altered states of consciousness, which does uh, include drugs, and I have done a lot of them since a very young age. This one was quite different, and it, you do really get the idea that this is, this is a medicine, and you get it very, very quickly, uh, not just in sort of the the, the mindset of the people there and the setting, but in the actual physical experience. So for those people who don't know, can you talk a little bit about what the, what the chemical is, sort of how it's, how it's ingested, what, what happens, how it's made, all of those things, so that people can get a little better idea of what it is that we're talking about when we talk about ayahuasca. 
Totally. So first of all, as a substance, it's been used for thousands of years by the South American people. Um, and what it is, is it's actually two plants, right? The traditional brew has ayahuasca, which is a vine, and another plant called shakuna. And the shakuna, the leaves, which actually have the tattoo on my arm is shakuna, and this is ayahuasca on this side. Shakuna has in it DMT, which is actually a substance that shows up in our pineal gland and our brains around day 49 of gestation. Hmm. And it's also released when we die. And spiritual people feel like that is the physical manifestation of our soul in our, you know, our beingness because, you know, you know the theory, uh, 29 grams that the moment yeah, that you die? Yeah. yeah, so the moment that you die, you secrete DMT as well. And so, you know, I think there's credence to the idea that that is the physical part of our soul there in our third eye. It's called ayahuasca, though, because ayahuasca is just one of the only plants on our planet that creates a protective coating or, or a veil around the DMT and you ingest it as a tea. So if you just ingest it to Shakruna, the DMT without ayahuasca, you'd pee it out, you wouldn't have an experience. But ayahuasca creates that protection so that your natural DMT in your brain is released when you drink it and you have the opportunity to have these very cosmic out-of-body experiences. Which, by the way, it happens sometimes when you dream. In really intense dreams, sure, you experience sure. DMT as well. So that's the best comparison, right, is, is a very intense, vibrant dream is the best comparison I can give to ayahuasca without having someone have, having done it. So, the the other aspect of ayahuasca is that I guess for for most people, most people's experience is in we talk about it's it's in the setting of a ceremony, which is different, I think, than a lot of drugs. That the ceremony that there's a ceremonial aspect, and that there are things in addition to the chemical that are really kind of very important for the whole for to get the full fullness of the whole process can you talk uh, talk a little bit and explain uh, your, yourself as having been a, a a leader of these ceremonies and an organizer the significance of the ceremony what happens in the ceremony and why why the ceremony is important to ayahuasca yeah it's such a good question because any of us that have journeyed in any altered space you know that set and setting is a big deal uh, and so what the ceremonial space creates is, first and foremost, we want to make people feel safe. So they feel totally comfortable that they can do the inner work and that they don't have to worry about anything external, that the space is controlled, nobody's going to bust in with pizza or, you know, disturb the space. And we have a lot of, you know, kind of energetic tricks that we use in addition to other plants and things that we do to create that space. Of course, Sage, who is the old standby in any kind of sacred space, she just helps to cleanse and to create um, an environment where you feel like you can just really go deep. So that's that's step one, is, is creating a womb, basically. And, um, and it's really, it's super important that anybody embarking on an ayahuasca journey make sure that they're doing it with someone who is treating it in that sacred way uh, and that you know you know what you're drinking the brew and you know who you're with because the shaman is gonna sing songs that are um, extremely powerful and healing and these are songs that have been passed down for thousands of years and you also need to be aware that the vibration of that individual resonates with you and that they've done their own shadow work because you don't want to be super vulnerable in an altered space sitting in an environment with a really toxic negative person that is essentially spewing that at you in, in song. And, and I've been there. I've, I've worked with people that, um, let's just say they haven't done their shadow work. It's not mm. necessarily bad people. What is, what, is sh what is shadow work? Let me just, let me just stop you because I think it's, it's, it's very important. It's something that... I, f I feel lucky that I don't, I, I think I went into uh, th this whole thing at a time in my life where I had, I had by hook or by crook had to do a lot of work with my ego previously. So 
either maybe I wasn't surprised by what I was about to go through or it was made a little easier, there was a little less burden there, but what is, what is this? Because it's a very, very important concept that I think people who have not walked through the process, I think it might be hard to understand and it might be something that's actually scaring people to hear the term shadow work. Yeah, well, and not to scare them further, but it should. <laughs> in a, no, it's a great question. The way that I use it is in context with how Carl Jung, the great psychotherapist, talked about shadow, which it's just the aspects of ourselves that we're afraid to confront and look at. So I like to say there's a Mother Teresa and a Hitler in all of us, right? We're all made from the same source. We all have the capacity to go in any direction on the spectrum of life experience. But if you live in a repressed space where you're afraid of violence or anger or any expression of what we would call a darker emotion, then um, then it has a hold on you. And you know you have the propensity to become more of a violent, angry human being if you haven't looked at your shadow, the dark side of yourself. Can I, can, I stop, can I stop you for one, can I stop you for one sure. second on that? Just, just, to, just to go back to what you said, if you live in a space where you are frightened of violence, mm -hmm. you have a better chance where, it, so it's where you're, you're pushing back the idea of violence. You're pushing back the idea of ideas of hate. You just don't, you don't want to deal with them. That, that, that's actually how you're going to manifest those things or how those things are actually going to come into your world. Totally. Yeah, I mean, there's this great expression, that which we resist persists, hmm. and I would add, and intensifies. Hmm. So, and, and, and I relate to the person, like, you were talking in your first hour a lot about our political landscape, and how we've got a lot of people protesting violence. Well, I remember I was at a peace protest, hmm. fighting for peace. Right, right, and, right. I had this epiphany of like, wait, and this was like 15 years ago before ayahuasca, and I had this epiphany of, hold on a second, you don't fight for peace, yes. you become peace. And so that was one of my first conscious moments of looking at my shadow and realizing I'm fighting for something out of anger because I'm angry that other people are angry. Right. That means <laughs> I'm part of the problem. <laughs> So that's what I mean by the, the things that we are ignoring and resisting, they actually have a hold on us. It's like if you're in emotional pain, if you just try pushing it away repeatedly, it hurts so much worse. Whereas if you draw a bubble bath and invite it in and say, okay, I'm ready to feel this and cry or release however you need to, it, it releases its hold, maybe just a little bit in that moment, but you know, it doesn't, it re removes you from that space of suffering. And yes, it, it does, it does. It makes, a, it makes a lot of sense to me. I think, I think though, uh, many people are, are so unaware that this is even a part of their life, although I think you and I both know that in the society that we live in, it's so, there's, it's so cluttered and it's so dirty in that way that uh, I'm saying on a psychic level, yeah. right, that it's, it's almost impossible to be in this society and to not have, to not have these issues with your shadow and especially having the distractions to not to not deal with them. So how, I guess, I mean, I know some of these things for, for myself, but I mean, you having been, having organized ceremonies, having sat in ceremonies with hundreds, thousands of, of people, how, how in talking with these people, how does the how does the plant or, and it really, it feels, it feels more like a spirit. And perhaps if you could talk a little bit about about that experience and because that's very different what is what is it that this spirit that this plant that this process is doing how does it dig in because it does it is getting in i call it a psychic massage i guess like it is going to get in on those places and and dig and dig real hard but it's going to release it what is what is happening or wh how do you understand it how do shamans understand the process that that is taking place okay so let's first address that plants have consciousness, everything has consciousness. Plant consciousness is different than ours, of course, it, they, plants communicate in different ways, but they have 
personalities. They have an essence. So when you take ayahuasca, and like you said, I think I, I know I've sat with thousands of people. I can't think of a single person that after a dose or two didn't feel the presence of a female spirit. I, I did for sure. An older female spirit, as a matter of fact. For sure, yes. 100%. Yeah, yeah, even these hardcore skeptics after ceremony would be like, oh my God, it was like this female was talking to me. I'm like, well, she was. So it's, and, and look, I can't keep a house plant alive. When I started this process, I thought that was insane. And here I am, the plant whisperer now. So I can, I can attest to the skeptics that it's absolutely true. You are ingesting a very powerful plant consciousness. All plants have different personalities, so I'll speak, but ayahuasca specifically, I call her the medicine of duality. It is the only altered space that I personally have ever been in, and I've been in a lot of them, that goes in both directions. And what I mean by that is the cosmic space that we're used to if we've done any other psychedelics. So mm -hmm. you feel your consciousness expand, and, and like some of the images that you're showing on the screen, like these colorful kaleidoscope, like mm -hmm. sacred geometry things come in. So you get to go cosmic. But more importantly, what makes her different is you get to go deeper into you. But you get to do it from like an airplane view, right? You're 30,000 feet up and you have a less um, attached, identified view of yourself and your patterns and the things that you're going through. Um, now, that doesn't mean it's easy because it's 30,000 feet up. It can be, it's literally, I mean, the hardest thing I've ever done. The dark nights on ayahuasca are terrifying. But the fact that you have that presence, that awareness that there's this spiritual entity kind of guiding you, it's very comforting. You don't feel alone, even though you have to do the work yourself. So that's how I kind of describe on a scientific level how ayahuasca is able to get us into that shadow. Is she expands us in both directions. And really that's all she is. We call her a healer, but she doesn't actually heal anything. We learn to heal ourselves she expands our consciousness into a place where, for example, you know, for me, I realized in my first ceremony why I had migraine headaches. Hmm. She didn't heal them. She showed me the trapped emotion, gave me the invitation to feel it, which I took, which is why it was horrific. You know, you can imagine, like, at that point, 30 years, basically, of emotional trauma that I had repressed right here without knowing it and took the invitation to feel it and um, cried and purged, which purging is a normal, natural part of taking this medicine. It's a way she moves the energy up and out of us. Now, but when you say purging, can you, uh, can you tell people what, what it is that you mean by purging? Growing up, <laughs> it's right. a nice way to put it. Yeah, yeah, but, but contrary to popular belief, ayahuasca does not have alkaloids that causes us to vomit every time. I, having drank as often as I have, you know, I, I got to a place where I didn't purge very often. Uh, so it's not a given. It's, it's one of the ways that ayahuasca helps move stuck energy in us because our physical, emotional, mental ailments, all of these are just energy that is stuck because we are just energy, right? So ayahuasca is, is a master at, at moving and you feel, her, one of the symbols for her is a snake. The reason being, when you drink it, as you know, you feel this upward motion. Oh yes, oh, yes. through your body. <laughs> yes, and, and again, the, the theme of resistance is very prominent in ayahuasca. If you resist the purge, it's gonna be horrible and nightmarish. Whereas if you invite it and you say, okay, I'm going to allow this and I'm going to stay open that maybe if I'm lucky, I'll get insight into what I'm releasing. Sometimes you can connect, you know, it's guilt, sadness that your father passed, you know, anger, whatever. Sometimes you don't. Either way, it's such a gift and it feels so amazing to get rid of shit that's been in you maybe for years and years. So, this we talk a, a lot on this show about this concept of resistance uh, being, and and look, it's kind of things that we talked about in the first hour. I think it really it really is a massive. If there's any consciousness shift, I, I think that, and we talk a lot about politics on the show, but it's it's really to show it kind of from a more in, going internal 
conscious, consciously and changing who you are inside, and then the world changes, very much changes outside. Resistance is a, it's, I mean, this is a, a plant that teaches you, no matter how much you think you're able to surrender, this is definitely a, a process, ayahuasca, that teaches you how to, to, how to surrender and why resistance is bad. Why, why is, we're taught in our culture that resistance is good. And as a matter of fact, this, this word resistance, particularly by some uh, sectors of the population, is really seen very, as a very powerful thing. We are the resistance. We are standing up against this thing. We're resisting, we're resisting, we're resisting. In the clips we played for the, the Women's March, resistance was a word that kept coming up over and over and over and over again. What is the problem with, what's the fundamental problem with resistance? And what is, what, what is it about it? And what can practices like uh, shamanic practices in ayahuasca teach us about shifting our consciousness? What do we get when we stop resisting? And what is the alternative? Ah, I love this question. So, um, I didn't march, by the way. I wasn't one of the women because I have nothing to resist anymore. At least I consciously try to cultivate that space. Because resistance is fighting fire with fire. Mm. It's taking the same energy that you are resisting or that you perceive that you are resisting and, and slamming it up against the same energy. And so what are you going to have? You're going to have more of the same. You're going to stay angry. You're going to stay miserable. You're going to stay divisive and separate from your brothers and sisters. And it's, it's a necessary part of the process to evolving. I was an activist and a fighter, and I totally get that mentality, and it's necessary when it's genuine. Mm -hmm. But I think for most of us, there's a place where we realize, wait a second, it's, it's not actually helping. You can't fight fire with fire. There's, my favorite quote around this is from Martin Luther King Jr., that you can't drive out hatred with hate. Only yes. love can yes. do that. Right? And, and there is no love in resistance. It's anger. Love is underneath that, but that's not what you're expressing. So to bring it to ayahuasca, she shows you through your journey into self that when you're looking at the parts of yourself that are super ugly and uncomfortable, just like we see in our culture and our government, we look at aspects of mm -hmm. shadow that we find really uncomfortable, control and violence, etc. Ayahuasca gives you that opportunity to look at it in yourself and to, and, and you can resist it, of course you can, but it sucks. Right. <laughs> and those are the nights that are miserable, you know, and, and you realize at some point if you're lucky, like, wait a second, I'm causing my misery here. The emotion is what it is, but the resistance to it is actually the core of suffering. So <laughs> when you release that, because, like, I'll give you a really tangible example. In ceremony, one of my jobs is always to make sure nobody's in fetal position, you know, like curled up. Right. Because energy can't move through us when we are clamped down. So I always try to keep people's shoulders back, especially if I feel they're going through something challenging, to breathe and let the, the energy move through, to drop resistance, to mm -hmm. accept what is, and let something else come forth. So for me, that's why resistance is um, just an energy that I do my best not to play with. Right. It hurts. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I, have, I have gained so much, uh, and one of the most interesting things about this, this process, and, and certainly this journey, and mine is, you know, I, I think under a dozen ceremonies so compared to, you know, people who have done hundreds, but I've gotten, I mean, I've gotten everything from being able to forgive members of my family to like, dude, organize your, your space at home a little bit better. Get your office organized and get your file cabinet, which was one of the weirdest ceremonies I ever had where it was like, really, file cabinet? That's like, that's what I'm, that's what I'm getting here. But it's, it's interesting how, how many things when you walk into this, how, how many things you start to realize you really don't have a handle on. And... I, you know, to the point of resistance, I, I do often feel like it's very, that, that resistance is very arrogant in, in many ways because it does assume that you have the right answer 
I find myself constantly searching for answers, and every time I get close, I realize that I really don't, I really don't have it yet. <laughs> is that is that something that has kept bringing you back and has had has seen you expand? Is that sort of it's because it seems like I mean a thousand ceremonies, you st but yet every time I talk to you, you say you're still growing, you're still still realizing oh, more and more and more. When does, it, when does it stop? Like, do we ever get it? Well, I think we've got examples of people in history that have gotten it, you know, that are prophets. I sure. think Jesus and Gandhi and sure. even, even MLK was close, right? And, and Mother Teresa. We see people who are close, but what they do is, is they give us an example that our suffering as a human being is a rite of passage. It's just part of what we go through. And I get feedback a lot from people that expect me to be Jesus basically after drinking ayahuasca a thousand times and I'm far away from that. Because this, you know, this journey into being an, an enlightened being, if you want to use that term, I think it takes lifetimes. You know, I look at the, the person I was 10, 15 years ago, and, and I have transformed tremendously, but I'm not Jesus, mm -hmm. <laughs> not anywhere close. So I think it takes lifetimes to reach the state of consciousness that some of our prophets kind of mirrored for us, because, you know, look at how, look at, we can see the progression of our individual evolution by looking at our culture. And it's plain to see we've got a long way to go. And that's okay. I mean, that's why we're here, is to evolve. And so for me, it's totally okay that, that on a personal level, I'm still neurotic, I still have fear, I still, I still have all the things that tripped me up as a human. What is different is that I am spacious enough to be totally okay with that, you know, and, and to be gentle in myself when I slip back into being arrogant or egoic or resistant or any of those things, to catch myself and go, oh, that's so cute, I'm still human, all good. Yeah. How 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 do you know? How does someone know if they're ready to start this process? Because it seems like when you, I think you and I have known each other for maybe three and a half years at this point, perhaps. And it's interesting because I feel like when I met you, this whole ayahuasca thing was, and I I, I seem to have this happen in my life a lot, but. Ayahuasca was not quite yet in the consciousness, and it was like literally three months after, it was just like, boom! Now every, every person that I talk to has pretty much at least heard. Many yeah. people are interested. I'm having friends of mine who are saying, yeah, I did, you know, went and did the ceremony, whatever, but maybe it wasn't so good, something happened. How does someone know when, one, it's time, and two, now that things are different, I was very lucky because I guess there was, since it wasn't out there that much, finding you and finding the group of people that, uh, that you had sort of collected, <laughs> if you will, was, uh, I, I, felt, I felt very, well, that, that she, the vine, had collected. It, uh, I felt very safe. It really felt from the jump. But I think now people are going out and they're, they're pursuing it it definitely leaves the opportunity for it either not being the right time for them or it not being the right route that they're going. How does someone know if this is right for them? And then once they decide that it's right for them, what, what process should they go through? What things should they be thinking about or, or not worried about, but aware of as they, they seek out someone to do this with? So you know because two things occur. On an internal level, you have a calling. That's what we like to call it. And you find yourself sort of Googling more information about it on off hours and thinking about it, or you have dreams about doing it, and it starts becoming a very um, prevalent part of your consciousness. So you feel called. Whether that's for five seconds, you know, they don't, that's all it took for me. I heard the word and I was in. I, I knew I was called. For some people, it takes them years. Of, of getting into a place where they feel they're ready after hearing about it, and it's all perfect. But then externally, you know it's time because you've connected with a place that makes you feel safe. 
you know, with organizers and or shaman that clearly have your best interest in mind. And so when you're, when you're embarking on that process and you have the opportunity, you know, um, my big thing is just make sure who, you, who you're sitting with, first of all, has trained for years. Not, I mean, I literally have seen people from the group I've been a part of that drank twice and felt that they were ready to lead ceremony. Hmm. That terrifies me <laughs> because you're really like, you're trusting people. This sounds dramatic, but you're trusting that shaman with your life. Not necessarily physically, because people rarely, rarely die, only if they already had pre-existing pre conditions. But from a spiritual perspective, you are super vulnerable mm -hmm. and potentially could be traumatized rather than go some, through, through something very healing. Mm -hmm. And so when you're interviewing you know, and getting to know the, the people that are organizing, you trust your instincts. If something doesn't feel right, don't push that aside trust that because there are a lot of groups that even if they're doing it from a really pure place they haven't done their shadow work so you don't want to sit with somebody who has any level of fear with the medicine or any stone inside of themselves that's left unturned because that could become part of your experience and you're there for your own personal journey not to hold space for you know, a shaman that's having a bad night <laughs> right. and can be super, super traumatizing. So, you know, ultimately with both, are you ready? And is the group you found the right group? You just, you trust yourself. We know these things. We are very highly intuitive beings. We just sometimes let our heads kind of overwrite what we know to be true. So it's very instinctual. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I think I think we've we've covered the things about ayahuasca. Now I would like to talk about because I find this very interesting and it 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 ties in and I know that this comes from your own experience. This this practice that you have now developed, uh, which I think even talking about it for many people is is a little bit scary. But this afterlife coach, can you explain to us, we, you and I have spoken about this a little bit, can you explain to us how you, what is, what is an afterlife coach and how did you come to decide that this was something you wanted to do? Well, I got it from ayahuasca. So I was doing, okay, so it started with one thing that I want to mention about somebody embarking on this journey is the ayahuasca ceremony itself is actually one piece of the puzzle and it's sometimes not even the most important piece. The most important piece is what you do with the experience. Mm. As with any transformative experience, aha moment, expansive kind of space, it's easy to go back to our old patterns and not integrate that profound opening. So I started doing life coaching with people that came and had profound experiences with the medicine and needed help integrating it into their daily lives so that they could benefit from that expansion and not just have it be an experience they sort of put on the back burner. Well, that kind of spun into a place where I was really acting as a therapist, which I'm not, for people that of course wanted to come and talk about all manner of, of challenges in their life. And I knew that wasn't the core of, of what my soul came to do here, to assist. and. Death kept coming up. Ayahuasca, in one interpretation, the word itself means vine of the soul. But soul and death is the same in Quechua, in the language of which hmm. that comes from. Because they don't believe in death, in terms of death being an ending. It's just your soul leaving its house and going on another journey. So death kept coming up. And one day I'm in ceremony and the expression afterlife coach came through. I feel it was a gift from ayahuasca. And I'm like, that's, that's what I want to do. I want to help people come to terms with mortality. Because I totally feel, Vin, that if we didn't fear the fact that we're all going to die, if we knew and felt from a space of wisdom the eternal nature of our souls, we wouldn't be protesting, killing I each agree. other. I agree. 100%. 100%. So that's where this all came from. What's going to happen with it? I have no idea. There's not like a blueprint of here's how to be an afterlife coach. But I'm using all of the shamanic tools that I've been gifted 
to help people specifically with the fear of death and at the end of their life when they know they're terminal and and they and they want to go out in a a much more protected spiritual way which by the way most other cultures do this in terms of creating protection and a safe loving space for people who are dying we don't but i'm kind of passionate about trying to bring that back to our western culture too of treating death as a really sacred rite of passage wow very very important i i also agree with you uh quite quite a bit i this this concept of uh the fear of death being so important uh for i don't know if i ever told you this but for a period in my, I guess I was 20, I lived in a dojo and just studied Kyokushin like as a, as a live-in student. I don't, know, I don't know if I ever told you that, but it's based on, um, it's kind of a modernized version, Kyo, the Kyokushin live-in. It says Budo, which is like a, the, the warrior way. And what I learned when I was there was the sort of, the, the spiritual and psychological things that what it took to be a samurai and people would think that it was all about sword play and you're wearing your armor and could you ride a horse and could you shoot uh, a bow and arrow but the true measure was really an absolute non-fear of death that that was truly what what gave these men their power was that they had gone out and they had figured they had truly to their core, they were no longer afraid of death. And what you're able to do at that point, and who you're able to be, and how, how principled you're able to be, I think that that's really what it comes down to, is that if you're not, if you don't have this fear of death, which is the ultimate fear, that that's when you can really be principled, don't you think? That that's when you can, that you can really say, this is what I believe, and I'm going to live up to it no matter what. Yeah, death is just the shadow of life. It's the ultimate shadow. So if we understand that and are willing to literally invite it in, not just go, okay, I'm going to die one day, I'm not going to think about it. But one of the things that I do with people is give them an opportunity to really visualize their death and invite it in. Like, what do I want to wear? What song would I want playing? Like, you know, really spend time. Not that we get to dictate it. If we're lucky, we do. If we're hit by a bus, then not so much. But it's just a matter of befriending that space. And you use the operative word, at least I think so, is power. Power is, is an as aspect of sh a shadow that a lot of us are afraid of. You know, of, because we attribute power sometimes to the dark side, which is violence and, you know, using power against somebody else. But our shadow gives us the opportunity to use power in a positive way. And to me, the ultimate space of power is, is truly knowing that there is no such thing as death. Because then you realize you're kind of in a video game and you can play without that same level of fear and you can own your own personal power, which is what I feel our souls are here to do, is we all have a special imprint of power that when expressed authentically is is going to uplift the world and raise the vibration. But it all starts with understanding shadow, which is, of course, the, the deep seat of, of death, of mortality. So we, I think we're living in, we, we spoke earlier about how amazing the times are that we're living in now, and a lot of people would, would think that I was just maybe talking about tech, technology and the way that those things have moved. But, we're also, I mean, as, as we can tell from this conversation, we're also now rediscovering, we're having a renaissance of some technologies that have been around. And I, I guess I would call it a technology. Like, it's, it's a technology that's been around for a very long time. And, and maybe there's some, not maybe, I know that there's some greater chance for, for healing. And I really, I thank you for coming on, for sharing this. I'm sure that there's quite a, a few people who um, have maybe heard of ayahuasca. I think that seeing you and I, meeting you via, uh, via this interview, that they'll probably feel a lot more comfortable, that it's something that they might want to approach. I advise everybody to, uh, to approach it. Is there, I mean, is there anything that I've, that I've left off that you would want to leave people with as they sort of start down this journey? 
just to re-emphasize just you know, trust your own intuition around whether you know you feel you're ready and that you found the right people to guide you because I can't emphasize enough how important it is to feel comfortable in that space because you don't you don't want to add to your trauma you want to heal from it I love it. I love it. Well, Kat Courtney, thank you. Thank you for uh, sort of sticking around through all of our little technical difficulties. But this was uh, this was a wonderful interview, and I think that you have, I think that you have added so much not just to the show, but I think to all the lives of all the people who are watching. So thank you so much, Kat Courtney. Thank you for doing this and for having me, Ben. All right, bye. See you. Well, Christian, do not switch over because I think that we have. Uh, oh, you're there. <laughs> All the all the buttons are messed up now because we had to we had to switch back to our old uh, our old setup. Well, look at that. We had we had to struggle through. We were resisting. It was worth it. We were resisting, but then we let go and we were like, you know what? Whatever. <laughs> Interesting show today. Yeah. Interesting show, and I'm I think that that's going to be a theme that we're going to continue to look at is that maybe if we stop resisting and start listening to each other really Absolutely. start listening and it's something that we've talked about talked about before and i talk about quite a bit is that i think what, what we're really missing man is we're missing giving people the benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. and we're missing that because we don't give ourselves the benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. yeah like maybe just maybe maybe the percentage of bad people out there and there are some but maybe it's a lot smaller than we think it is yeah it is i think it's a it's a it's a phase just like resistance so resistance i, I think um what you're seeing right now within the world and within politics and stuff like that mm -hmm. is resistance and re and she talked about it a lot it's it's a way of building something stronger right you know so it's a phase but you get past the resistance and you move into the embodiment, into the creation, into the manifestation phase, and that's where the real magic happens. So I think what we're witnessing right now is is a phase, is just a cycle. Hmm. Well, I mean, I'm 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 now almost after that conversation, dude. I'm almost now ready to go back and be like I have been laying off doing ayahuasca ceremonies, but mm -hmm. I'm thinking that it might be uh, might be time again with this new this new uh, situation yeah. that we're in. So I think we're coming down. Yeah, we're, we're almost out of time. Thank you, Christian. I'm going to say goodbye to the people. So we are living in a time of transition, and we are coming into a new phase. There's so much new in our world right now. And yet there's so much resistance to that newness, so much resistance to change, but yet there's a, a profound opportunity. We have more chance than ever before to realize and to fix and to heal those things within ourselves. Perhaps we've come full circle. There was a time when every single person that you would ever meet in your life you had basically known your whole life, with, that you were living in some small tribe with some band of family. And now that we can connect to one another as never before, perhaps we have that opportunity to become that single human family once again. But we've got to decide to be open. We've got to decide to allow other ideas in, to allow new concepts in, to realize that it's not going to hurt you, that they're thoughts, not threats. And we're going to watch what's going on in the world of politics, of course, and next week we will definitely have our technical issues figured out. But I want to thank our guest, Kat Courtney, for, for sitting through and dealing with us through our technical difficulties and for sharing such wonderful information. Ayahuasca has changed my life. Uh, if you have questions, you can certainly reach out to me. I can definitely put you in, in touch with Kat as well, and I'm sure that she would be happy to, to talk with you if it's a journey that you really want to take. Next week, we have another fantastic guest. Monday, 10 a.m., live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Vin Armani, on Facebook, on the Facebook page of our content partner, Activist Post, Facebook, 
facebook.com slash activist post and on Twitter and Periscope at Vin Armani. So until next week, stay free.